Don't be a smart aleck. Good morning, somebody. Say good morning to somebody that you don't know, that you, don't, you haven't talked to in a while or you don't even know. Shake their hands. Say good morning. It's a lovely, wonderful day in the Lord. The rain means nothing. This is good. Amen? Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Let's, um, let's get this party started. We'll start off with some announcements. Congregational prayer meeting is going to be this Thursday, the 20th at 7 p.m. right here. 6 p.m., I take that back. 6 p.m. right here. Led by our elder Ted Johnston here at 6 p.m. here in the main sanctuary. Praying for our church leaders, our government, praying for Israel, and all of the very most important things. Amen? Anybody love the Lord today? I, Amen. Come on. We love the Lord. We can love Him when we're doing announcements. We're going to love Him in praise and worship. We're going to love Him when we get home. Amen? Amen? So we'll get through this. Pastor Aaron's not here, but Friday Night Live is the 21st. Now, if you haven't been or sent your kids to Friday Night Live, it's a time that they bring all the kids together. We have a wonderful time there. They play games, and more importantly, the Word of God is delivered to our children at their level so that they can get it and understand and learn how to apply the Word. But they have a wonderful time. It's really, as the kids would say, it's off the chain. So if you haven't sent your kids, send your kids over. It'll be on Friday the 21st, starting at 6.30. Yes, 6.30. Amen? Amen. Tracy, you have an announcement. And Miss Paula. Hi. I, there's, it's kind of empty, but maybe you know somebody <laughs> that you can tell because I don't see a lot of college girls here. But we're having something special today. for our. It's college age girls, but it's age 18 to 25. You do not have to be in college. We do have girls that aren't in college. So I'm going to let Kara, because she's one of our girls from our YWOW. Yay, Kara! And she's here. I have a girl that's here, and she's going to tell you what we're doing today. So, You're welcome. Today we are having a potluck Thanksgiving lunch. I made lots of mashed potatoes, so any girls who are between the ages of 18 and 25, um, just come on out. It'll be in the building next door uh, where we have Children's Church in the four-year-old room. So... Um, it's a good time we get to fellowship and um, pray with one another and um, just help each other out spiritually. So come on out. It'll be great. All right. Now, mashed potatoes. You heard the mashed potatoes are going to be there. We'll load them. Loaded mashed, loaded mashed potatoes. We could add the other stuff. Loaded with butter. It's loaded with butter. That's enough to get you to come. Mashed potatoes loaded with butter. Uh, Chiquay, come on. I think I'm coming, and I'm 32. Okay. Um, good morning, church. Uh, again, for the announcement of the Christmas play this year, it's going to be about love languages. It's going to be very cool. And don't worry about signing up because we have dates where we're going to meet this week, Tuesday, 6.30, here at the church, Thursday, 6.30, here at the church. We're going to have a script read. I need the following departments, people who like to make things, bring things from their garage, like props. Uh, people who like to make things and backdrops, singers, dancers, people who just like to move things around. I need everybody. <laughs> so if you want to be a part of it, tell your friends 6.30 Tuesday here at the church, 6.30 Thursday here at the church. Thank you. Thank you. Miss Paula? Paula's not here. Okay. Girls Night Out. Now pay close attention, ladies. The date has changed. It's December 2nd. So if you don't come that day, you're going to miss it. There won't be one at the end of the month. <laughs> December 2nd, Girls' Night Out right here in the sanctuary. The food will begin at 6 o'clock, and Miss Linda's going to bring the word at 7 o'clock. Amen? Amen. Let me give you a quick word of encouragement. You know, I was just thinking about the Lord and how much power there is in our praise and how important it is for us to understand that when we praise and worship God, there's power. There's things that are being released. 
And I was looking in the book of Acts, chapter 16 and verse 25, where it says that at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and they sing praises unto God. And it said that the prisoners heard them. And then it said, suddenly there was a great earthquake that came and opened up every door and every chain and every fetter that was attached to them was released because they were praising God, and then there was power released in that. There is power in your praise. When I say power in your praise, there's power to get the things that you desire of God today. If you praise him in truth and in sincerity, God can release power to you through your praise for healing. You praising and thanking him and worshiping him, the power is going to be released to heal you. There's power to be released for deliverance. There's power to be released for salvation on this place. If you do what? If you praise him and thank him and be prepared to receive it. Amen? Amen. There's power in our praise. Let's give our Lord a hand clap of praise. And let's get ready for that power to be released. Amen. Let's stand and worship.
glory. coming into this place. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Please be seated. Please be seated. Hello. Praise the Lord. Time to take up the offering. A chill forgiver. Love. God loves a chill forgiver. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. If you are giving cash and you want to have that recorded, the ushers are giving out an envelope to you fill out. I just want to share a scripture with you that I thoroughly enjoy. It's a red letter. Jesus says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Press down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For the measure that you meet, it shall be measured back to you again. You know, the Word of God is incorruptible. You cannot corrupt the Word of God. 
if you take a seed, any seed, like an apple seed, orange seed, and you prick that seed and you put it in the ground, nothing's going to happen. It won't grow. It'll rot in the soil because it's been corrupted. The Word of God is incorruptible. You cannot corrupt the Word of God. So Luke 6.38 is alive and it's sharper than you two-edged sword. So apply that to your giving today. Give cheerfully because God sees what you do. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give unto you. We just pray that you multiply it for your kingdom and for your glory. We praise you. We honor you right now in Jesus' name. Amen. truth that we all know that Jesus died on the cross for us we wake up every day with that knowledge and as we try to go through our day and try to figure out what can we do what can we say to try and repay him for that precious gift and I think we all know subconsciously, deep down inside. The best thing, 
believe even the only thing that we can do is to try to draw closer to him. Crucifixion is a horrible, horrible thing but such a wonderful blessing to come out of it. The only thing that we can do is to try to come close to the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. We draw near, Lord. We press close to you. We draw near, Lord. As we cleanse our hands, we draw near, Lord.
As we try, Lord, as we try, Lord. Praise the Lord. Obviously, I'm not your pastor. We miss him. He called me last night, and uh, Greg went to a wonderful conference in Toronto, Canada, had a great time, um, and um, guess what? He got marooned in Charlotte, couldn't get out, said it'd be 9.30 this morning. Well, we hope he's in uh, town by now, so guess what? Holy Spirit is here. And we're going to be blessed today by the Word of God. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. So let's just pray for a minute before we get started. Holy Spirit, we love you so much. We could not move. We could not do anything unless you guide us, you release your power, your giftings through us, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. We love you so much. We pray that you'll guide us, open our understanding, challenge us. Lord, heal us, deliver us, set us free this morning in the areas of our life, in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, we worship you and love you. Father, you are a father to those who have no father, and we love you this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Well, uh, I just want to mention one thing about our prayer meeting Thursday night. That is a time that we'll spend before the Lord uh, we don't look at the hours. We say we're starting at 6, which we will, and we pray till we pray it out. Uh, basically, we go uh, to uh, midnight on this, but we, I firmly believe in my heart that unless we pray, no power. Amen? We have got to pray. We have got to be a prayer-believing church. And so, to do that, you have to spend protracted times in prayer. Fifteen minutes won't get it. And so what we're doing is that we have different areas that we pray. We divide it up into hours, and if you want to come in and spend an hour with us, a half hour, two hours, whatever it is, we don't look at who leaves and who comes. But last time we had a great crowd here, and we prayed. We had a wonderful time of just supplicating before the Lord, petitioning the high priest of our profession, right? And he hears it, and then what he does, he takes all of our prayers and takes them to the Father, perfects them, and the answer is on the way. So I want to encourage you all to be part of our prayer fellowship this coming Thursday night. Starts at 6. Well, let me tell you that we're in exciting times, right? We are in exciting times. As I said in the first service this morning, the times of the Gentiles are almost upon us. That means that God and Paul, when he turned to the Gentiles in the New Testament, 
And the gospel was started to uh, be proclaimed to the Gentiles, which is most of us here today. There was a time frame in God's calendar that the gospel will continue to be proclaimed to us, and then it's over. And when it's over, the church is out. The church is caught up, and then we begin that time when ministry is made uh, basically to the children of Israel, although there will be many Gentiles saved, but it will be a time of the worst tribulations that this earth has ever seen and ever will see. So there is a time in which we have no more time. It runs out. And so this morning we're going to be talking about the crucified life. What does it mean to have the crucified life? Now this applies to every one of us in here this morning. And I want to start off by telling you that I like to, I like history, I'm a history buff, and one of my favorite things when I get a chance is to go through a, a two or three hundred year old church and go back and look at the tombstones and look at somebody that has lived a hundred, two hundred, three hundred years before me and see what it says. I want to see what their life was all about. And a lot of times they'll leave a little appetite there. In Northampton Cemetery in Massachusetts, there are some famous uh, graves there. One of them has the name of David Brainerd on it. He died in 1747. He was 29 years old, and he died of tuberculosis. He was a missionary to the American Indians. In those days, you did not have the protection that we have today. He traveled by horse. He had no tent with him. He had no uh, rain-repellent uh, garb on him. They dressed in a heavy wool in those days. So he fought the elements as they were, and he went in, and you got a couple of miles off the given roads in those days. You were in a uh, wild country. He would go in there, and he would get to know the Indians. He would preach to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. He would have no protection from the elements. He'd pull branches over himself. Once in a while when he had a chance, he would make a crude little dwelling where he could escape from the elements. When he died, he had 12 converts. 12 converts. At his side, in another grave, is Jerusa if I pronounce her first name right, uh, Edwards. She was Jonathan Edwards' daughter. Jonathan Edwards was one of the greatest theologians in the history of our nation. She took care of uh, David Brainerd until he passed on to heaven, and she was gone in two weeks. Because in those days, you had typhoid fever and things like that with no antibiotics, they know nothing about treating these very uh, rapid diseases that would just choke the, the life out of you. And so she was buried at his, at his side because she was his bride-to-be. Jonathan Edwards was so affected by David Brainerd's life that he wrote a book about him. And that book, a copy of that book, went to England to Cambridge University. It landed on the desk of Henry Martyr. Henry Martyr read the life of David Brainerd and was so compelled to give his life in service to the Lord, particularly to India, that after his education, he went to India. He didn't last very long. He started getting sick, uh, deathly sick, and on his way back, he lay down in a bunch of saddles that were made for camels to, to escape the blare of the heat. He was in Tokat, uh, Turkey. And there he died at the age of 31. Now, you know, we have no earthly idea sometimes when we look at the lives of men and women of God that have gone on before us, what was different about their life? What was so impelling that caused them to give their lives many at an early age? And I believe that it lies in the secret of what we call the crucified life. You may want to call it the fullness of the Spirit and different things. But it's a life that's totally yielded to the Lord. And I'm going to start off and read in John 12, 24 through 26. We got some of these scriptures up on the screen, but didn't have a chance to do this because of last night. 
Now, I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just one grain, never becomes more, but lives by itself alone. But if it dies, it produces many others and yields a rich harvest. Anyone who loves his life loses it. But if anyone who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. Whoever has no love for, no concern for, no regard for his life here on the earth, but despises it, preserves his life forever and ever. That's a pretty tough word. Right? Amen. Would you say that? And basically that word says that Jesus comes first. Jesus is the reason that we're alive. Jesus is the reason why he's given us these years that we have to be in this place. Do you know that before the world was created, God had a plan of how long your life would be? Now he promises us long years, but some do not live those long years. Some of us are cut off by accidents and things like that. But God has a purpose in us being here in this day, in this uh, part of history, and it is to glorify and honor Him. So there are two things that uh, F.B. Meyer said. F.B. Meyer was a great theologian, and and he says, I'll just read part of this, but he says, if our physical life becomes an end in itself, if self existence is thought of as the completion and the end, in itself, sacrifices abhorred, the natural fear of death and instinct to self-preserve ourselves become self idolatry and the life will abide alone. In other words, we are totally absorbed, of course, in ourselves. That's natural in a way. But we become so totally absorbed that we, we think about how long we can keep on living here as well as we can, But when it comes to self-sacrifice, we have to deal with these things, and a lot of times the flesh wins out. I'll have to be honest with you. Sometimes it does in my life, and I am quick to repent, but it does happen that way. So there is a difference in a believer in talking and doing. When we talk about the crucified life, uh, it has a, a connotation of constantly this conflict between our spirit and our flesh. And in John 12, 24, we see the tremendous potential of one seed if it dies. Many people use that scripture on their gravestones. We we have used that scripture on our son who went home to be with the Lord many years ago. But it yields a lot of fruit. The Aqua Indians, the thing that happened to those five men became martyrs in 1955. Many, many, many Uh, young people went into the mission field because of that. But you know, I use this example, a turkey, you know, Thanksgiving turkey, that says, I am an eagle, I'm an eagle, I can fly high, high, high. Well, they don't usually fly more than 30 feet. They can't get across the barnyard. But, you know, that's just about as much as a believer saying, I'm a mighty, mighty man of God, I'm a mighty, mighty woman of God, But you're never seated in that area of sacrifice and selflessness which we need to recognize in our life. Now, we look at Jesus. He was a total success, wasn't he? I never could figure out how Jesus could uh, could, uh, be reared in a large family. He had eight or nine in his family. Mary had many children, and they were his half-brothers and sisters because his father, Holy Spirit, versus they were through Joseph, and yet, if you'll read the apocryphal writings, you never saw Jesus getting into a fight. Whenever they would, for instance, sit down to eat, and they had, I'll use fried bologna. I'm sure they didn't have fried bologna in those days. You remember tomato casseroles in World War II? That's all we had to eat. Anyway, griping, complaining, I don't like this, I don't want that, and all that. You know what Jesus would always say? He says, this is, this is good enough. He would always be a reconciler. And we know, of course, at 12 years old, he was confounding the, the scholars of his day. 
But Jesus knew that he was destined what? To die. He was destined to die. And I believe, and I've said this before, that all 12 of the apostles of the Lamb, that was Matthias, not Judas Iscariot, knew that they were going to be martyrs. They were committed to that, and they knew that before Jesus went back to heaven. So we see this thing of Jesus living a selfless life, and then we in our flesh are constantly sometimes in a war with how we use our time, with how we use our talents, and in Matthew 16, uh, 22, here's a classic picture of how the flesh and the spirit are warring with each other. Jesus had just got through telling the disciples that he was going to have to be, go to Jerusalem, that he was going to have to die, he was going to be crucified, but he would ra- rise again. Peter says in Matthew 16, 22, then Peter took him aside, Jesus, to speak to him privately and begin to reprove and charge the creator of the universe. Charge him sharply saying, God forbid, Lord, this must never happen to you. Then Jesus responds in his selfless life and speaks to Peter. He says, Peter in Matthew 16, 23, but Jesus turned away from Peter and said to him, Get behind me, Satan. You are in my way, an offense and a hindrance and a snare to me, for you are minding what partakes not of the nature and quality of God, but of man. Jesus loved Peter, but Jesus was speaking to the flesh man that was trying to rule the day when Peter said that. Jesus knew what his whole mission was here on earth to do only what the Father did and eventually end up at Calvary and pay the ultimate price for you and I. One of the classic verses that we have is Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ and him I have shared his crucifixion. It is no longer I who live, but Christ the Messiah lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, in the body I live by faith, by adherence to and reliance on and complete trust in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When we say, I am crucified with Christ, that's exactly what the scriptures mean. We are no longer supposed to be controlled by the flesh in our life. We are putting him first in everything that we do. That means that television takes second place. That means that hunting and fishing takes second place. That means that golf takes second place. That means that sowing, whatever you do, takes second place. Jesus, Holy Spirit, Father God, takes first place, first place in all of our life. We say, good morning, Father God, Jesus, Holy Spirit. We spend some time with them in the morning and hopefully most of us are spending time with them in the evening. You need to have worship time with the Lord. You need to worship Him. You need to say, I love you, I adore you. You're the rose of Sharon. You're the bright and morning star. You're the day star. You're the love of my life. I love you, I love you. And I love you, Holy Spirit. And you know that I've told you, Holy Spirit, when He speaks to me, He uses my nickname, Sonny, so I know it's Him. Maybe He does that to you just a family name or something. So I enjoy and I want to hear Holy Spirit's voice. Now, we use terms like dying to self, the spirit-filled life, the crucified life, but what does it all mean? I got another passage here for you, a lot of word here, but I need to read it. 2 Corinthians 4, 10 through 11. This is talking about you and I always caring about in the body the liability and exposure to the same putting to death that the Lord Jesus suffered, so that the resurrection life of Jesus also may be shown forth by and in our bodies. For we who live are continuing to experience being handed over to death for Jesus' sake. 
Now that doesn't sound like a lot of prosperity teaching that I've heard. That the resurrection life of Jesus also may be evidence through our flesh, which is liable to death. My brother and my sister, when we go through things in this life, the Bible says we are to praise God. I know it doesn't feel like that, but we need to go through rough times. If we had a smooth time and never had a ripple to occur in our life, something is wrong. Something is wrong. Because you have the destructor of your life, the devil. He wants to destroy you. He wants to mess your family up, your kids, your grandkids. He's out to do it if he possibly can. I'm teaching the book of Zechariah, and I can tell you that Satan stood before Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest to accuse them. That's what he's all about. So when we talk about prosperity and we talk about being, having enough, we can very easily slip into the lay of the sea and type thinking. And we let off our guard. We don't pray as much. Things are going right, man. Company is doing wonderful. I just got a promotion. I'm healthy. I just had my annual checkup, man. There's nothing wrong with me. God has blessed me. A deal is coming through. My, my, I'm in love with my wife. Everything is going wonderful. Sometimes, though, when things are going so wonderful, we can be left off our guard. And that's what we've got to watch out. So wherever he went, whatever he encountered, whoever he encountered, Jesus had this, this selfless life, and he was blessing people. In Psalms 47 through 8, then said, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Now, the key there is the word of God is in your heart. How much of the word of God do we have locked in our heart? Listen, the word of God is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Well, if it's in our heart, it's doing something in there. It's, it's, it's changing us. It's rerouting us. It's convicting us. It's dividing us under our soul and spirit. You know what? I want God to reveal anything and everything that's going on in my heart. I don't want any secret sins going on in my heart. And when I sin, when I cut off that lady or that man in traffic, or when I get uh, perturbed at someone in the grocery aisle that cut in front of me or will not Get off the list and go. See? The Holy Spirit convicts me. One time, is this your story? Okay, I'm getting ready to do something, which I know is not quite right, but I feel like I'm going to do it anyhow. Up within me came, yield not in temptation, for yielding is sin. That was the Holy Spirit. Convicted me by bringing that up to my attention. I had never thought of that old Baptist hymn that we all know we used to sing. First Peter 2.23 said, When he was reviled, Jesus, and insulted, he did not revile or offer insult in return. When he was abused and suffered, he made no threats of vengeance, but he trusted himself and everything to him who judges justly. Now, let's look at the possibility of being a castaway. Paul had that one fear in his life of being a castaway. Sounds like something on a ship that you would, they would throw you overboard or something like that. But he, was, he saw himself as running in a race continuously. Some of you are marathon runners. I used the first service to say, Al, he was a marathon runner but I missed it for about 30 years. He used to be a marathon runner, but maybe some of y'all do that now. But here is Paul. He says in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. In other words, he had this sense of, I have a responsibility before my Lord of walking the walk, and doing exactly what the Word of God says, because if I fail, others will be impacted, and I will be a castaway. doesn't mean I'm going to lose my salvation, but I'm going to be put on a shelf. 
Can you think of people that have made major blunders in their Christian walk, leadership, and now they're on a shelf? So that's what he had a great concern about, is that he ran his race, that he stayed exactly on course with the Lord. And his great passion, of course, was saving souls. And I think Tracy had mentioned this earlier, when they were in prison, I mean, you can't imagine how bad it was. Their flesh had been ripped off of their backs. They were uh, no, nothing to eat, probably no water, a totally dark place, no light. And it was about midnight, and what did they do? Rather than gripe and complain and scream, they sang praises to God, and praises will chase the devil away. And the angel of God came, and they and everything dropped off the chains, the handcuffs, the stocks, the doors opened up, and the jailer thought they had all escaped, of course, and he was about to take his life, but Paul said, no, we're all here. That's what praise and worship can do in the midst of rough times that we go through in life. It's part of the crucified life. Now, have we become, some of these questions I ask myself, have we become so familiar with sacred truths such as the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, hell, lost souls, heaven, that the freshness of their meanings have sort of smoothed out in our consciousness and we no longer think, okay, we're talking about being born again and somebody needs Jesus, but we really don't understand that's an eternal, eternal thing that when we're talking about a neighbor next to us or one of our family members and they do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, maybe there's someone here this morning, you don't know the Lord Jesus. He died at Calvary for you. He has already paid the price for your sins. He's already had your name there on the cross. He knows where you are. He knows you by name. I was praying for the Western Sahara Last night, it's a tiny nation on the, uh, the Sahara Desert, nomadic tribes. There's not one witness of Jesus Christ in that little nation of 600,000 people, roughly. And so, you know, I started prophesying to the nation and declaring, walls will come down, walls will come down, walls will come down, walls will come down. And you know what? That's what God wants us to do. When we're looking at impossible situations, like in Turkey, I used to uh, travel a bit when I was in the business world, and I knew a man from Turkey, and he and I uh, roomed together in Malta, and, and I was reading my Bible. I don't think he was reading the Koran at the time, but he, uh, we got along very well together. Now that I think about Turkey, not one gospel witness, it says, in Turkey, and I think about him and his family and where they live and what they did in business, and I said, I've got that face before me to constantly remind me that I need to declare Jesus Christ is Lord over Turkey. And he died for every person in that 90 some odd million people. And without Jesus Christ, they will face a Christless eternity. Many years ago, A.B. Simpson, who was a great uh, hymn writer, a mighty teacher of the Word of God, he founded what we know as the Christian Missionary Alliance. They send missions, missionaries all over the world. But he wrote in one of his hymns, Once it was a blessing, now it is the Lord. Once it was the feeling, now it is his word. Once his gift I wanted, now the giver own. Once I sought for healing, and now for him alone. All in all forever, Jesus will I sing Everything in Jesus and Jesus, everything. The music to that is wonderful. Maybe sometime Phil will learn how to sing that particular song. 2 Corinthians 2.15 says, For we are the sweet fragrance of Christ, which excels unto God, discernible alike among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. How many of you have walked into a situation uh, a business or whatever it was, and people say, there is something about you. There is something about you. I mean, I think all hands will be raised on that because I know you impact 
where you are. John Osteen says, when I walk in, God walks in. I used to first didn't understand that, but I said he's exactly right. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it says really in the Amplified, is inside of us. When I walk in the bank lobby and make our deposit, I say, thank you, Lord, and we laugh and we have all kind of fun with the tellers, but they know that I'm a believer and they should know that you're a believer. Well, what makes you so happy? Oh, I've got the joy of the Lord, Susie. Where did you get the joy of the Lord? That's when I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And he's such a joy to my heart. See, there's opportunities that God will give you to do that. So in radiating that, that fragrance in this self-crucified life, do you look like him? Do you have a countenance that's full of joy and happiness and peace? Do you talk like Jesus? Or are you out there judging and condemning? Please do not run down our leadership. They are personally our responsibility to pray for. Our president, our vice president, all of our congressmen, our senators, we are commanded to pray for our leadership, not condemn them. You don't always have to agree with everything somebody says, but you pray for our leadership, you bless them, long life, safety from terrorists, the whole area, of just like you pray over your family. Is your conversation about Jesus have you recently discovered what he has spoken to your heart? Do you record, as pastor has encouraged us to do, in a prayer journal, when you hear something from God, when he does something for you or your family, that you're remembering that and you're writing it in there so that 15 years down the line, you can look back on the victories and see where God has brought you as you trail your prayer journal. Do you act like Jesus? Are you easily offended instead of being a blessing to others? So this leads us to flow in the crucified life. One of the keys to all of this is getting back to the cross where it all started. Where you were originally born again. Sometimes you have to retrace some things in life. Sometimes you have to say, you know what, I think I got off the trail here somewhere. But you know, God is in the business of restoring. And as far as we're concerned, we are the sons and daughters of the living God. Most of us, if not all of us in here this morning, God has called us to be priests and kings to our God. In the Old Testament, it says that Israel was specifically set apart to be priests until, until the earth. That's the reason they were not to intermarry or anything like that. They missed it big time, Jeremiah Almost the whole book of Jeremiah is written about the judgments upon Israel. But I guarantee you one day they will be returned to that priest condition, that priest function in the millennial period. Praise God. We're looking forward to that. But have we really reckoned our old man is truly dead? Have we really said, look, Jesus, I give it all to you. I surrender all, and I begin to... Lord, as I look at my life, I see the ugliness of the self-life. You know, the self-life is what turned Lucifer, son of the morning, into a devil, didn't it? So we don't want that self-life to any way rear its ugly head and have its control in our life. See the cross as we come to it. See, that's where I met Jesus. I met him 10, 15, uh, 50 years ago. Made him just recently. That's where my life began. That's where a rerouting of everything that I was to do in life began, started, and went forward. Look at Jesus hanging on the cross. Having you in mind because he was God in the flesh, but God the Father, the Godhead knew who he was dying for. That's every man, woman, and child upon the face of this earth. That's where there's never an impossible situation that you can't claim a nation or a group or a family member for the kingdom of God. If you will persist in prayer, if you will constantly lift them up to the Lord, I believe that there will be things, a divine intervention eventually that will at least bring them to confront the gospel, have the gospel delivered to them, and many, many times be born again. So don't give up on those that you are praying for. Amen. Amen. So Jesus became sin for us who knew no sin that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. Father God looked 
at that blood being spilt. He saw that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And our sins had to be paid for. And he paid the price at Calvary. So my opinions, my rights are all under the blood. I no longer, now listen to me carefully, I no longer have the right to judge my brother. When you start judging a brother or sister, you're in big time trouble with God and with the head of the church. Because when you judge another believer, you are affecting Jesus Christ himself. And I'm telling you right now, and I'm speaking to myself, that we have the solemn obligation to have nothing in our hearts that would be against any brother or sister. You know, there's a difference between forgetfulness and forgiveness. If there is anything in us in the past that has happened, and we have still that forgiveness in our heart, we must get that, that bondage broken and that thing under the blood of the Lamb. That's very important if we're to live the crucified life. All of the plans that God has for me, the use of my time, my talents, everything is in the Lord Jesus Christ and it started at Calvary. So it's no longer bless me, but make me a blessing to others, right? Amen. It's no longer help me, Lord, but let me be a help to others. It's no longer me and mine first, but God, you're first. Your righteousness and your kingdom. The only way I can tell you if we got it right is that if you're the pers person in the line for the fried chicken, you're in big time trouble. <laughs> Defer. <laughs> Matthew 10, 38 and 39. And he who does not take up his cross and follow me that is, cleave steadfastly to me, conforming wholly to my example, Jesus, in living, and if need be, in dying, also is not holy of me. Whoever feeds his lower life will lose the higher life, and whoever loses his lower life on my account will find the higher life. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's stand. Praise God. I want to have a ministry this morning, but first of all, as Pastor always does, and I want to ask you this morning, I know, know everybody here, but the Lord Jesus Christ, once and for all, as I've already mentioned, went to Calvary to die for every person that was on the earth, every person that had lived, and everyone that would live. So that means that your name was there. And if you have never asked Jesus Christ into your heart to be your Lord and Savior, if you have never had that thrill, that experience of knowing him, knowing that your past was forgiven, knowing that you have his life within you by the Holy Spirit of God, a lot of people will tell me when I ask them, are you a Christian? Oh, yes, I'm a Christian. I said, well, have you ever noticed or sensed the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, inside you? Because when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there's a divine, heavenly transaction that takes place and the Holy Spirit of God comes inside you and seals your spirit. So I know that I know that I was 60 some odd years ago when I was 11 years old, the Holy Spirit of God came inside me. And I know that I'm destined eternally. I'm a citizen of the celestial city. Amen. Amen. All right. But some of you may have never made that decision. So I'm asking if you would come down here right now. We're going to pray with you and we're going to together agree that Jesus Christ is going to become your Lord and your Savior. Any of you young people that have never received Jesus and you want to do that this morning, you want Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Any of you older people, it doesn't matter the age. We want to see you come down, receive the Lord, have your life changed. Know that you know that you know that there's nothing between you, nothing between you, the Lord and your Savior. He is your Savior. All right, we'll wait just a minute. All right, we're going to have a time at the altar.
for two reasons. One, if you feel like you need a fresh breath, a fresh anointing, I want you to come down. We're going to lay hands on you and pray for you very briefly and just ask God to do something fresh and new in your inner man. And then for those of you that need a touch from God of physical healing, we want you to come forward. We don't want you to ever go out of our church knowing that you have something that's troubling your body and you've not been prayed for. So if you need us to pray for you, lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So we need our eldership. Just come on down. Y'all come on. Don't be bashful. You need prayer. And our home group leaders, and Tracy and Toya, we just need to, we want to pray for you this morning. Amen. Go ahead, Phil. Play us. Now.
on there we go we're believing for a fresh touch from the Lord we're thankful that the Holy Spirit right now is already doing a great refreshing work and father as I lift my hands over the audience I thank you for all of my brothers and sisters here this morning I pray father that we will be bountiful fruit bearers in the kingdom of God in Jesus name I thank you for fresh visions fresh dreams direction of the Holy Spirit for the gifts and anointings of Holy Spirit to be released to us as he sees fit so Lord we receive your word this morning we're walking by faith in the crucified life every area of our life is yielded to you and we want to impact our generation for Jesus Christ and we praise you for it in Jesus name amen amen thank you for being here